Hi, and welcome to the show. Subscribe at kevinmd.com slash podcast. Get CME for this episode by clicking on the CME link in the show notes. Today, we welcome Peter Grinspoon. He is an internal medicine physician and a cannabis specialist. His Kevin MD article is titled, Cannabis is Ground Zero in the Fight for Racial Justice in America. Peter, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So we'll talk about your article and book in a little bit. First off, just briefly share your story and journey to where you are today. Sure. Well, I have been involved in the cannabis issue my entire life for probably for two reasons. One, my brother Danny, when he was fighting an unsuccessful battle with leukemia, my parents illegally bought him cannabis in the early 1970s, right when Richard Nixon was starting his war on drugs. And it made such an incredible difference in my brother. When he didn't use cannabis, he'd be lying in his bed, throwing up, like sort of miserably dying. And when he used cannabis, he could like eat, hold down food, and most importantly to me, play with his little brothers. So I knew that cannabis was a medicine, for, not for everybody, but for some things, starting at a very early age. And that really impacted me as I went through and pursued a career in medicine. And I've been treating patients with medical cannabis for about 20 years now. The other thing is my dad was a very famous cannabis scholar as well, Dr. Lester Grinspoon. He actually called for the legalization of cannabis in 1971 when he wrote a um, called Marijuana Reconsidered, which was reviewed on the front page of the New York Times book review and was a really runaway bestseller. And he had been involved in the cannabis issue for the last 50 years of his life. He passed away about two years ago. So I've literally had a front row view of the legalization movement, and I've been involved in this issue for my entire career. So um, I have a pretty broad and deep exposure to, to medical marijuana. All right, let's set the table here. We're speaking in May of 2023. What's the current landscape as it relates to the legalization of cannabis and its use just in a primary care setting? Because that's something that I do and I see myself, I get a lot of questions. So what's the current landscape facing physicians today regarding cannabis? Well, first of all, it's legal medicinally in 38 states. There are still a couple states where it's not legal at all, Nebraska and Idaho. In, in the other 10 states, CBD is legal, but not, not cannabis. But 38 states is almost 50. We're really getting there. And then it's fully legal for adult recreational use in 23 states, almost half of the states. So, you know, probably more than half of Americans live in a state where it's legal recreationally. And, and most Americans live in a state where it's legal medically. Now, 94% of Americans support legal access to medical marijuana. Now, name anything else that 94% of Americans mm. agree on. They don't even agree that the sky is blue or the earth is that. So I think that there's pretty broad consensus that they've been, we've been sort of sold a bill of goods about cannabis by the government as part of their war on drugs, and they needed to taint drug use for other purposes. That's a whole nother conversation, but they there weren't enough people with just cocaine and, and heroin. They had to include cannabis, but a lot of, they've been pumping out nonsense for the last 50 years. And, and, and patients have really come around to this issue. Now, doctors, about two thirds of doctors right now are convinced that cannabis is a helpful medication. And, and that's, that grows every year. It depends a little bit on your vantage point. You know, almost all the oncologists, for example, believe that cannabis is helpful because they see it alleviating the nausea, the pain, the suffering, the anorexia, the insomnia of their patients. On the other end of the spectrum, a pediatric addiction psychiatrist, they see the rare but very tragic cases where cannabis might very much destabilize a young adult or a teenager with psychosis. And they tend to have very negative views about cannabis. So I think a lot of it depends on your vantage point. Primary care doctors, it makes our lives easier. It gives us an extra plant-based, relatively non-toxic treatment that patients love. It's not without harms. It doesn't work for everybody, but generally it helps us treat insomnia, chronic pain, anxiety, some of these most difficult things that we treat on a day-to-day -day basis. It makes our lives a lot easier. So I think many primary care doctors are going along with it well because they see that it helps patients and it makes their lives a lot easier. That's sort of a win-win for all parties. So take us into your exam room. What would be some common case studies where you would recommend cannabis to treat patients? Right. Someone with, as we get older and portlier and like the knees, the backs, the hips start to go, chronic pain afflicts millions of Americans. And the options for chronic pain are very bad. Tylenol does nothing that maybe hurt your liver. Nobody wants to be an opiate. So 110,000 opiate overdose deaths. And, you know, there's a lot of pressure, which is unfair on us not to prescribe opiates because some people really do need opiates and we need to provide them. Non-steroidals kill 10,000 people a year. You're 
ibuprofen, your naproxen, your diclofenac from heart attacks. They also kill people with bleeding ulcers. And I see so many people in their 50s, 60s, and 70s whose kidneys are just dying because of the ibuprofen they've taken year after year after year. So someone has chronic pain, a low dose of, of cannabis, mostly CBD, a little bit of THC. You start the patient on a very low dose, work your way up very slowly so they don't have a bad experience by taking too much that can make you anxious. Get them up to speed to where they're feeling better. The pain doesn't go away completely, but it doesn't bother people as much. It's less intense and they get more interested in other activities. Uh, chronic pain is a perfect example of a very common condition the cannabis is extremely effective for. Patients like it and it's often safer than the alternatives. So you have a patient like that, 50, 60 years old, chronic joint pain, osteoarthritis, like you said, a little bit portly. Would CBD oil or cannabis, would that be something first line for you? It would certainly be, be before opiates. You know, I, I tried Tylenol, why not? But it yeah. <laughs> never works for people. And then, so the question is, do I want to put them on non-steroidals or do I want to put them on, on low-dose cannabinoids? I, I discuss the pros and the cons of both with the patient. I mean, cannabis isn't good if you're a teenager, if you're pregnant or going to get pregnant. It isn't good before driving. It isn't good if there's a family history or any history of psychosis. So, you know, non-steroidals aren't good if you have kidney problems. So obviously, I'd veer towards the cannabinoids if someone has chronic renal insufficiency. So it really depends on the patient. But the fact is, to have another tool in our toolkit, especially in this area of chronic pain, where there's so few tools that work and that aren't deadly, is incredibly helpful. And so for a subset of patients, in my case, a pretty large subset, because I'm comfortable using it, it really is the best medication for chronic pain. It's safer and patients enjoy it. And the only obstacle really is that health insurance doesn't pay for it, which will change when we get federal legalization, but right now it's very, been very difficult. So tell me what the first step is. So if I'm seeing a patient in the exam room and I want to start some type of cannabis-based product, you mentioned things like CBD oil as a place to start. So so tell me where I would start, where I would send a patient to, what dose to use. So, so, so for those who have little knowledge of this, where does a physician start? No, that, that is a great question because physicians really need more practical knowledge so they can have helpful conversations with their patients because what happens is the patients go to like a, a cannabis doctor and then the primary care doctor doesn't know about it. And the, the, the way to keep all of this safe is for doctors to be educated and non-judgmental and for doctors and patients to have open, clear communication so you can deal with drug interactions and stuff like that. But I would ask the patient, first of all, have you ever used cannabis? If they're 80 and they've never used it, that's a much longer conversation than if they're like 60 and they said, oh yeah, we used it in the 60s. We loved it. I just haven't used it recently because my kids were young. Then you know they're going to use it, adopt it pretty easily without many problems. But the main way to do it is to start low and go slow. Nobody dies from a cannabis overdose. It's literally impossible. But if you take too much cannabis, it can be very anxious. It could even cause panic attacks and you could end up in the emergency room. So the key is to start low and go slow. So I usually start with mostly CBD, but CBD and THC work well together. I might recommend a tincture again with like four to one CBD to THC and just start with like a milligram of THC at night. Now, for context, if you take a puff, many of us have used cannabis, I've used it. A puff is like five milligrams. So I start with like a fifth of a puff. There's no way you can get in trouble with a fifth of a puff. It also won't do anything to help you. But the point is, I want the patient to really start at a very low dose. I say to them, we're going to make a mistake in the dose. We're going to give you too little, not too much. So you're a little bit bored and disappointed, but you're not having anxiety and a very bad experience. Then we can go up to two milligrams after a couple of days. Very easy with a tincture under your tongue. Three milligrams. And then by the time you get up to, say, five milligrams, they're usually feeling the edge of their pain has gone away and they're mm. feeling pretty good, but they're not feeling like super impaired. You don't want them to drive, but aside from that, they're, they're doing pretty good. So when you talk about these options, let's, I just want to be clear to definitions. What is the difference between CBD and say medical marijuana? That is a great question. So marijuana is a very complicated plant with like 500 different chemicals in it which is why some types make you want to sit on the couch and relax and whatever, listen to the Grateful Dead and other types make you want to like get up and go to a party and talk to people and or clean your house. Some are very activating. Some are very relaxing. Some are better for pain. Some are better for nausea, but THC is the 
primary intoxicating component of cannabis. It what gives you the highs, what makes you stoned. Some people love it. Some people hate it. Some people don't mind it. I view it as a side effect to try to be minimized and avoided. Now, CBD is the most commonly used non-intoxicating component of cannabis. CBD has been tried by one in three Americans, and currently one in seven Americans are on some kind of CBD product. People use CBD for most commonly for anxiety, chronic, chronic pain, and insomnia. It's very good for, uh, for performance anxiety, for public speaking. They've done some good studies. And there's increasing data that it can help with addiction to heroin, to amphetamines, to cannabis, and to tobacco. A study just came out yesterday that it helps with cravings for uh, tobacco addiction. Finally, CBD is approved for these intractable childhood epilepsy syndromes like Dervais syndrome. It's a FDA-approved drug called Apilidex. Now, just if I can make a, a mini TED talk, the U.S. government federally still continue, considers cannabis a Schedule One drug, which means no medical utility and high abuse liability. And that's like completely nuts because they have several medications from cannabis on the market. Marinol is just THC. Apilidex is just CBD, and it doesn't have high abuse liability. It has low to moderate abuse liability. Certainly, some people get in trouble with cannabis, but compared to opiates, alcohol, tobacco, many fewer people get into trouble, and the trouble they get into is much more manageable. Okay, so I find a patient that I think that CBD oil is a good option for. I say a tincture, one milligram of CBD oil. I send them to a dispensary. So now they walk into a dispensary. What happens next? Well, t just a slight difference. CBD, you don't need a dispensary okay. because CBD is everywhere. Like it's at, you know, Wegmans, it's at CB CBD, you can get anywhere. It's the THC that's at the dispensary. But you give them some general recommendations about how to start. You give them a suggestion about what to buy. And then you just have them, you know, work their, work their way up very slowly. Start with a little bit and take a little bit more the next night, a little bit more the next night. I have patients journal so they can talk about different types of cannabis, what helps, what doesn't help, what dose helps, what side effects. Keep in mind, some people smoke it. Doctors don't usually recommend smoking. There are other ways to take it inhalationally. You can get a contraption that's called a dry herb vaporizer that heats it up to 400 degrees instead of incinerates it at 1100 degrees. So you can extract the cannabinoids, yet you don't get the tar, the benzene, the combustion products. Some people really do like to inhale it, like if they're on chemotherapy and they feel right away they're going to vomit. They don't want to take a tincture or an edible. They need immediate relief. On the other hand, some people take edibles. They take their gummies, their chocolates, their pills. Now, those are good in the sense that they last for a long time. So if you have chronic pain, they can give you relief, long-lasting relief. The only problem with edibles is that they're harder to titrate the dose because they take about an hour to kick in. And you just don't want patients making the rookie mistake where they take a dose, nothing happens. They're like, nothing happens. And then they take four more uh, 15 minutes later and they end up like way too high. Yeah. So I educate people, the patients about that a lot. And then finally, the topicals are amazing. The topicals you can rub on your sore joints. That's very low hanging fruit because you can't get high. You can't misuse. You can't addict it, get addicted to a topical. But I did want to mention that these days it's a different world. You can get at a dispensary, you can get skin patches, you can get an inhaler, you can get a suppository. There are all kinds of delivery devices for medicinal cannabis. It's not just a question of smoking a joint. It's just like any other medicine these days. Now, how would you know what to recommend to patients? You mentioned there's so many different forms, edibles, something topical, suppositories. Do people who work at dispensaries, do you trust them to choose the best option for your patient when they walk in? Well, they can be helpful with some of the nuts and bolts. But the problem is it's a fine line between giving information about the nuts and bolts, you know, an edible versus the tincture and giving medical advice. And clearly people with dispensaries shouldn't be giving medical advice. And that's something that causes a lot of anxiety on the part of doctors. They have bud tenders is what they're called, the people working at the dispensaries giving medical advice. And the solution to that is to educate doctors so that doctors can give people very specific suggestions. And then people can iterate on that because it is an iterative process. It's not like you have high cholesterol and I give you 10 milligrams of Lipitor or you have high blood pressure and I give you 10 milligrams of Lisinopril. I don't know if you came to me as a medical cannabis patient for insomnia, I wouldn't know how much you'd need. 
you know, but we always use for all medications, the lowest effective dose. So I'd again, literally have you get, start with one milligram. And then the next couple of nights, try like two milligrams and start low and go slow. Understanding it's not going to work really well at one milligram, but we're going to safely and gently get you up to speed. So it's just a different process that doctors have to get used to. It's like a paradigm shift. It's a, a little bit less paternalistic. Like I'm going to tell you exactly what to take and more like I'm your partner. These are some, some suggestions. Why don't you try them out? Journal, write down what works, write down what doesn't work. Let me know how it's going so we can fine tune in a couple of weeks. And it's just a different process. It's a very rewarding process, but it's definitely a paradigm shift. So what will be the next step after? or tinctures of CBD oil. What would be your next step in your algorithm if yeah, someone wanted CBD, to move beyond CBD oil? Yeah, if the CBD isn't working, it, it works well for a lot of people. And, and for a lot of people, it, it doesn't work like any other, anything else we do. Yeah. I would add in a little bit of THC. Now, THC is a little more complicated because it can be addictive. It's psychoactive. It causes the high that, again, some people like, some people hate, and some people just find a nuisance. You can't, after using CBD, you can't drive or you shouldn't drive, just like you shouldn't drive after using Benadryl, you know, opiates, gabapentin, mm -hmm. benzodiazepines. So it's a little more complicated, but I almost always end up adding some CBD because CBD and THC work very well together synergistically. In fact, a lot of people believe that whole plant cannabis works much better than just THC or CBD because many of the molecules are medicinally effective in very small quantities. And there's something called the entourage effect where you have all the different molecules of cannabis working together to alleviate your pain, your anxiety, your insomnia. So a lot of people think full plant cannabis works a lot better. But when you get a tincture and edible, a lot of times they just take full plant cannabis and condense it into a tincture or an edible. So people get the benefit of all the major and minor components of cannabis. CBD is not addictive. It's not, there's no misuse liability and it's very safe. You know, very high doses, you might want to check liver tests mm -hmm. once in a while. And the only problem with CBD is that it acts just like grapefruit juice. It can competitively inhibit the P450 liver enzymes. Consequently, it can raise the level of your blood of certain other medications. It's not a big deal if it's like, you know, whatever, ranitidine. But if it's a blood thinner, an immunosuppressant, you know, a anti, you know, a, you know, an anti-epileptic, and you need to have a narrow th therapeutic window, you need to let your doctor know if you're using CBD because open communication is the most critical component. But so I would start with CBD. And then if that doesn't work, I'd add a little THC in. And if that didn't work, I just, you know, maybe have them get some full cannabis and give it a try. You know, again, we don't like people smoking it, but there are all these other preparations such as the edibles, the tinctures, mm -hmm. many different options. If anything, it's bewildering when you go into a dispensary because mm -hmm. there's so many different options these days. It used to be like, do you have access to marijuana, the plant, but now there's like hundreds of different options. So that's why another reason why the more doctors are educated about this, like I, I spoke to a bunch of doctors, addiction psychiatrists in a medical dispensary about six months ago, and it was a great experience. They answer, answered all their questions. It destigmatized it. It demystified it. They got to see all the different um, all the different products and they got to ask questions and they got to talk to the bud tenders. The bud tenders got to ask the doctors questions. So I think we could do things like that. You know, doctors can just see these dispensaries and it really makes it a lot more real and concrete for them. And they understand a little bit better why the patients are so interested in it and why the patients are clamoring for it. Talk about the costs. What would a typical month's regimen be of, of say, you know, starting with CBD oil? Well, it's expensive. That's the problem. CBD, these little gummies cost like a dollar each. And, you know, you take a couple gummies a day. So I would say for either CBD or for medical marijuana, it could be one to $300 a month, which is not covered by insurance. Again, once we get federal legality of cannabis, which will happen sometime in the next two to 10 years, insurance companies are going to have to pay for it. Maybe they'll start paying for it when, when President Biden is going to reschedule cannabis from schedule one. That's going to make it a lot easier to do research, and it's going to also make it easier for the insurance companies to pay. The insurance companies are making a killing on, met, on marijuana. Even when it was legalized in Colorado recreationally, there was an article from the Journal of Health Economics in 2016 that the Medicare Part D costs for all the medications and all the categories that could be treated by medical marijuana, pain and anxiety, insomnia, muscle spasms, all these costs went down and, and Medicare D 
in Colorado with, recre- with legalization of recreational cannabis, they saved about $200 million. I mean, the insurance companies are making a killing and they, they will end up having to pay for this. It's just they're hiding behind the federal illegality. And it's very tragic because, you know, one patient recently, they didn't want to be in their opiates. And not only did we get them off their opiates, we got them off their benzodiazepines, which is very, very common with medicinal cannabis. And they came to me after about three months and they said, I'm feeling better off the opiates and off the benzos. My memory feels better. I'm more awake and alert. I'm not constipated. But mass health costs $1 for the Valium and costs mm. $1 for the Percocet. Yet my medical marijuana was costing me $150 a month as opposed to $2, one for the Percocet, one for the Valium. So they had to go back to the Percocet because I work in an inner city clinic and and people just don't have $150 a month. But the last thing we want, just like with psychedelics, which is another discussion, the last thing we want is medical marijuana to be another treatment just for the wealthy, the white, and the well-to-do. So I feel very, very strongly that it's got to be accessible to everybody, which is why a lot of us are working really hard to pressurize the insurance companies into paying for this. And just to reiterate, you mentioned this earlier, what are some red flags or patients that we definitely should not consider cannabis-based treatments for? Well, it's thought to be harmful to the development of the teenage brain. So unless they're like my brother Danny, they're dying of cancer. Or there's a lot of interest in using mostly CBD with a little bit of THC for kids with autism. I mean, it's hard to argue that CBD is thought to be safe for kids. This level of THC is more dangerous than the Adderall, the Thorazine, the Haldol, all the stuff we give these poor kids. But generally speaking, teens shouldn't use it. I don't recommend it for pregnant women or breastfeeding women unless, for example, they have some very severe hyperemesis gravidarum and you know they're in the hospital getting IV Haldol and IV lorazepam. It's hard mm-hmm. to argue that that's safer than a little bit of medicinal cannabis. It can destabilize people with a history or family history of psychosis. I don't think it, quote unquote, causes schizophrenia. But if you have psychosis, you should not be using any form of cannabis. So we don't use it in those populations. And then also we educate people very, very carefully not to drive before consuming cannabis. And my final question, Peter, tell us some of your take-home messages that you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience. Well, it's a very complicated topic. People have very strong feelings about cannabis one way or another. And as doctors, we've been subjected to so much nonsense about cannabis, it's hard to know what's what. And there's so much conflicting information, which is exactly why I wrote my book to help clarify all of this. But the take home message is to listen to patients. And regardless of how you feel about cannabis, you have to create an environment where the patient doesn't feel judged or stigmatized, or they just won't tell you about their cannabis use. That's true for all other drugs, by the way. So I think anything that we could do as doctors to educate ourselves about cannabis, about the endocannabinoid system, the series of neurotransmitters and receptors by which cannabis works and which they don't teach in most medical schools yet, and to facilitate a comfortable conversation with patients. We're helping ourselves. We're helping our patients. We're help- It's a win for everybody. Peter, thank you so much for sharing your time and insight. Thanks again for being on the show. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed our conversation. 